Okay, guys, I think that's um, most people that have joined by now, and we can get started. Okay, so thank you all for joining us today. It's uh, great to see so many of you guys that are interested in the UI UX field. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing from our wonderful speaker, Ms. Stephanie Walter. She's um, joining us to talk about her experience in the field, the profession, just anything related to those who are interested in joining. Okay, so let's jump right into it. For today, oh, um, just a quick heads up, if somebody wrote on the screen, it would be great if you guys could just undo that really quickly, if that's okay. But yeah, so for today's goals, we're mostly just gonna be doing the basics. So we'll be introducing Stephanie, her job, her role, give like a little bit of an intro about her, and then we'll jump right into the prepared Q&A session. So a lot of the students submitted many questions about what they wanna hear in regards to like um, Stephanie's experiences and her skill sets. And so, yeah, we'll be going through those list of questions and then you guys will get a chance to ask questions in person live after that session. And yeah, just the whole idea of today is to learn how you can get involved with the UX design field yourself. Okay, I'll hand it over to you, Stephanie, to take over. Yeah, sure. So, hi, um, I'm going to share my screen. Yay, can you confirm you can see my screen? Okay, good. So first, super sorry about last time. I'm really bad at time zones and in Europe we have summer and winter time and apparently it gets even more confusing because we lose and gain one hour uh, depending on if we're in summer and winter time. So thanks again for coming back. Um, as I was introduced, I'm Stephanie Walter. I'm a user experience designer. I'm currently working in Luxembourg, which is a small country between France, Germany, and Belgium. Like, it's really, really, really small. Um, yeah, I've been working as a UX designer um, for almost 10 years now. And at the moment, I'm mostly focused on user research and product design. Uh, why is it not going to the next slide? Uh, wait, I just need to arrange the screen because, yeah, okay, good. So uh, a little bit about my journey. So I always loved like design, art, computer science and languages. So I kind of decided I wanted to do something um, around this area when I was uh, a student. And I discovered there was a bachelor, no, a master degree in Strasbourg that was called Kawa, which was like web design and foreign languages. And so I decided basically what's the easiest uh, way to enter that master degree and was actually to do a LOA, which is a foreign lan languages bachelor. So I basically started um, by studying foreign languages in Strasbourg because it was kind of my entry ticket to the master's degree I wanted to do. And while studying languages, I already kind of tried to prepare a little bit more the whole aspect about web design, which means like I had some HTML and CSS lessons when I was doing my bachelor degree already. I was like taking some infographics lessons, which is basically how do you put the head of, the, of a lion on a white goat? It was kind of a lot of fun of those Photoshop things, montage and stuff. I kind of studied uh, Zoom Engine Optimizer, which is a SEO, so search engine optimization when I was studying in Germany. So I was doing this like um, language bachelor degree while already knowing that the next step was to be really something about web design. And uh, during the master degree, I was basically mostly interested into the design lessons a little bit less um, in the, the language lessons. Still, English is quite useful. <laughs> Actually, in retrospect, it was a good idea. So I finished my master degree and I found in, an internship in Germany. So there I was mostly uh, working on product design for Android and iOS. So I kind of decided to specialize in uh, this kind of mobile app design area because it was a little bit my first job. So yeah, as I said, working as an in-house product and UI designer, I actually didn't know anything about mobile design when I entered the field. Uh, you have to understand it was 10 years ago, so it was quite new. iOS was just kind of booming. Android 
didn't have a lot of design documentation. You know, today we have like material UI guidelines, stuff like that, some really, really amazing stuff by Google. At that time, it was mostly kind of developer uh, documentation for Android. So it was a little bit hard to find information. And I remember my boss at that time was like, yeah, you know, Android is not interesting. It's not an interested platform. It will kind of never stick around. So we will invest on Apple if you're here, <laughs> like 10 years ago, I'm still laughing at that, like, yeah, sure. So we were doing mostly like iOS and BlackBerry for those who know who it is. It was kind of, um, I don't know if we had like guidelines for BlackBerry, but it was mostly like following those things. So I worked at inside and uh, this talk is a little bit constructing around my different work experience and what like two key points for each one of them. And the first key point for uh, this experience is basically like just because you are out of school doesn't mean you can stop learning. And basically this is, I think the most exciting thing about our field, like every day there's a new framework, there's a new method, there's something new going around, like some things are good, some things are bad, some things are trends that might like go away like we used to have something called flat design we had like skeuomorphism neomorphism stuff like that so there's definitely some trends that go around and things but there's also like a lot of things that you learn outside of school because you you can't you know like no one can teach you a whole um kind of job uh, just in school so this is a really nice thing about i think the web industry and the development and the design industry it is you you will never stop learning and there's a lot of free resources out there which is i uh, kind of i'm super grateful for that because then you can i most of the stuff i learned i learned for free or maybe i just like bought a few books or like bought myself a ticket to a conference or something but there's a lot of like learning opportunities and you know you don't really need to pay for those which is i think an interesting thing because like basically anyone around the world can enter this kind of industry as soon as you know how to read and where to find those kind of information. And my second advice here is start building a network as soon as possible, as soon as you get out of school. Uh, when I went out of school, so I started having a blog. I was mostly talking about how did you do uh, cool, uh, I, like, cool rounded corners in uh, we using a CSS background and stuff like that because we didn't have like CSS border reduces and things and I wrote a few articles about stuff like whenever I was doing things, something fun or whenever I was, was kind of creating a piece of code or something, I was just putting it on the blog. And I also started the Twitter account. And um, those both combined kind of um, created a network for me. And this blog started kind of booming and having some followers over the years. And this is actually how I found my second job, which is basically, I knew a guy, I kind of helped him on the WordPress plugin. He helped me with a WordPress development of mine, we discussed. And there was a, an opening in his company and he, there was no, actually there was no job offer published yet. And he said, okay, hey, you know people, I know this designer, she's looking for a new job, so maybe we should connect. And basically he introduced me to his boss, he kind of matched, and his boss already knew me a little bit from Twitter and from my blog. And this is basically how I kind of found my second job or how my second job found me, to be more precise. So networking as soon as possible, building connection, but like real connection, not, not those kind of fake 100 people on LinkedIn you never talk to is really, really important. So then I went to work as a, in a web agency as a UX and UI designer. So I went back to France. At the beginning, I was still doing a little bit of HTML, CSS when I arrived, but uh, then I kind of stopped coding to really fully concentrate on design and usability. So I kind of became the UX expert or in French ergonomist uh, of the company. So what I like about working for a web agency is you never get bored because you're basically jumping from one project to another. So it's kind of a good or a bad thing, depending on your mindset. So you learn a lot from the different uh, businesses because you, load with, you work with a lot of different clients. Like one day you are going to work with the French government, then you are going to work on credit monitoring, then an e-commerce to sell uh, underwear in Australia. <laughs> 
that was a fun one. And then you are back to, uh, I don't know, working for um, a school or something. So it's really interesting uh, working for an agency because you get to know all of those kind of different businesses. When you design for them, you need to really understand kind of what are the goals, what are the needs, the user needs, things like that. So one of the things I would advise you to do is always question things. And it's really, really hard, I know, as a beginner, uh, especially as a student, because you don't feel like you are allowed to ask questions, but like ask why five times, or this is something we, we do in UX design. Most of the time you ask it three times because then it becomes quite awkward. But yeah, that's the idea. Like I had one client and uh, basically um, what we built for him was a landing page. So it was a page, you could put your email address, there was a small video and it's like, okay, product is launching soon, give us your email if you're interested. So he was building a newsletter. And then he came back to the agency, to the developer and he said, okay, I need to put some content on this landing page. And the developer started thinking about ways to turn this static website into something more dynamic with like no SQL DBs and WYSIWYG and super complicated stuff and like the client wanted to transform the landing page into something and can edit so the developer was like okay let's bring him to to edit it but then i arrived in the meeting and i was like yeah but why do you want to edit this landing page and he said uh i basically have a newsletter and i want this um i want to, to put the content of the newsletter on the website I was like, yeah, but why? He said, okay, because I have these chronological articles, I think it would be interesting. So by asking why, I reframed the question. And basically the guy was, what he needed was not to transform the landing page into something he could edit. It was basically a place somewhere on the internet to post something in a, like, posts in chronological order. In my vocabulary, we call that a blog. So basically, instead of having the developer develop a super complex, complicated stuff, just so that the client could just like change a few things on the landing page, we say, okay, you know what, we are going to uh, build a WordPress for you. And we are going to give you a tool that will uh, let you like basically put everything that is in your newsletter automatically in WordPress blogs, blog posts. And that's it. So by asking why and really understand actually what what the client needed and not what he wanted the developer to do, we were kind of able to reframe. Also, we kind of gained a lot of money because basically installing a WordPress and choosing a template and just putting the colors of the client was way less uh, costly. So the client was super happy that we didn't charge him like, I don't know how many days the whole development would have costed him. Then another thing, which might be a little bit harder and which happened a lot to me uh, when I was uh, working in an agency is don't get discouraged if you don't get to do a lot of user research right, right away. Uh, it was true a few years, years ago. I hope it changed. But basically when I was, uh, I think I was working uh, in, the, in the industry for three or four years at that time. And it was basically, we were really trying to push user research into the process. And but most clients, when they saw the, um, the whole estimation, the first thing they wanted to remove from the estimation was user research and accessibility, which is kind of <laughs> super sad. But um, so sometimes you have to find kind of way works around to be able to access the users. Sometimes you need to talk to the support. Sometimes you kind of can't talk to the people directly, but you can do some ways, things like that. So it's always a little bit discouraging, especially I think when working for web agencies, because as I said, you jump from one project to another. And sometimes they just like bring you right in, in the middle of a project. So it's kind of frustrating because you had maybe some people who took decision before that and maybe they already kind of started building wireframes or something. So you're like, yeah, but I really would like to talk to the users just to make sure that we, we are going to the right direction. So sometimes on some projects, it's a little bit too late. So that's kind of my main, uh, also why I don't want to work for agencies anymore. It's kind of, it's fun to jump, uh, to change project, you don't get bored, but it's also kind of super frustrating that you don't see all the time um, the users that you can't have access to them directly, things like that. Then uh, after that, I decided to accept an offer for a job in Luxembourg to work for the university. So. 
up until now, what you had to understand is like most of my UX and design skills were acquired through a lot of reading, through a lot of practice, through going to meetups, going to conferences, things like that. So when I got the offer from the university to work in a human computer interaction research group, I saw that as kind of an opportunity to get more strict method and more scientific method around user research and user testings. And here, um, a few key takeaways. Many of the user resource methods and tools that I'm using, um, I'm basically using them to do digital UIs like mobile websites, uh, mobile app, uh, responsive website, things like that. But you can use those methods to and apply them to a lot of different things that go way beyond digital UIs. So this is usually where the realms of UX design and CX design, CX being for customer experience and also service design being like, how do you design services around? So service uh, designing a services more global than just designing the UI. So this is where all of those kind of things blend a little bit. So when I was working for the university, uh, we did something really, really cool, which was uh, we designed some collaborative learning spaces for students. So we were basically designing rooms. <laughs> Like we identified three different needs for the students. The need to, um, ah crap, I can't remember them now. Like uh, the need to debate. So having some spaces where they can have actually, actually have a speaker in front of them, things like that. A uh, space to explore. So it would usually be like, okay, you gather a lot of information, you explore them. And a co-creation space, which is once you've explored and you've gathered all your information, you do something out of that. So. We basically apply the same methods, which is uh, usually first try to understand the user needs. So the pictures here on the right, it's um, one of the workshops we did with some students and some teachers where we uh, identified a few of those needs. We identified some tools and some softwares and some hardware that can support those needs. And we asked them to actually build uh, this collaborative learning space. And then what we did is like, we went basically through, um, to the students' cafeteria, and we had these little uh, UX kits, which was composed of uh, a small maps, a few stickers. So this is not the final version. This is the prototype I was designing. This is why there's a lot of stuff that is not finished. But basically, we we created this uh, small little envelope with uh, a plan, some stickers. Well, on the stickers, you had like chairs, computers, but you also had like hard hardware, like do you want connected lamps? Do you want Dropbox? Stuff like that. And then we asked the students to actually design their own collaborative learning space. So the idea was really to involve the students in that and here you see it's basically low tech like most of the stuff we use is like paper stuff we printed things like that and that's i think also a really interesting thing is as soon as you start kind of entering the, the realm of UX design, you'll see uh, pretty quickly that actually you can go beyond digital interfaces. At some point, you might be able to redesign processes within a company, redesign spaces like we did here. So there's a lot of things. I, I know students who work on, um, what's the name, like autonomous uh, cars and uh, autonomous uh, shuttles in some cities. So they're basically like designing a whole service around that. Then another thing I learned is uh, as long as I have a solid plan, I know what I, I know I can uh, then improvise. So I don't know if it's because I was working uh, with really amazing people and I knew I could count on them if anything went wrong during uh, a session, a workshop or something. Or if at that time I already have five years of experience. But um, what I understood is like adaptability, adapt stability and resilience are super useful UX skills, which is basically whatever you plan, like you, you plan for a workshop, you plan for user research, you plan for interview, nothing is going to go according to plan. <laughs> Most of the time, you'll have people who will not show up. You might miss the, um, the time frame. Like you said, okay, this activity is 10 minutes, this one is half an hour, this one is 10 minutes, things like that. So you're really prepared. And in the end, you end up having a first activity that is almost taking the whole hour or something like that. So the thing is, you can plan, you need to come prepared, you need to have a plan, you need to know 
what's the research about what you want to learn like what's the end goal what's the kind of information you need from the users but then it's okay if the 10 minute activity is lasting 20 minutes or the other way around as long as at the end of the day you got all of the information it's fine not to follow 100 percent the plan so this is kind of something that helped me a lot like get more relaxed when i'm doing some workshops things like that like not freaking out about if something goes not according to plan it should be fine then after that i went back to the private sector and i worked in a design studio for a consulting company um so this is a little bit unusual because most of the time consulting company what they do is like they hire you and they send you to clients uh here what he had is like basically a design studio which was working kind of like a web agency but within the design, uh, the consulting company, which means that I had two roles. I was working half time on a product, really, I like dedicated to a specific product. And the other part of the time, I was helping on any project from clients that had design needs. So it was kind of a weird mix between working on a product plus kind of getting back a little bit to work in an agency mode, but within a company, not for outside clients. So uh, here I learned that roles and responsibility of UX design often needs to be defined. So uh, not everyone understands what UX designers do and the role and the scope of this, um, especially in Luxembourg or I don't know in other countries, but in many companies in Luxembourg, uh, those companies are not used to have designers. We have quite a low maturity now, so it's kind of getting a little bit better, but not in every company. So. Up until now, the people who are doing the user interview, like big air quotes, were uh, business analysts. So sometimes you arrive in a company, they're like, yeah, we already have someone who talks to the user, it's a business analyst. And uh, oh yeah, we already have well, someone who does wireframe, it's a business analyst. But the thing is, uh, it's not usually the same job. Most of the time, the business owners are really going to focus on the business needs, maybe not the user needs. And from what I've seen so far, unless the business analysts have a background in design and also in uh, usability research, then most of the time, like the, um, the mockups that we'll create or the um, wireframes will be kind of not great. It will be basically, it will have a, all of the information but kind of the architecture might be wrong or things like that. So usually you still need a designer, but it's a little bit complex and it creates some conflicts because for instance, we had one project where the business analyst already did the wireframes. The problem is that those wireframes were done in balsamic mockups and it was kind of a 10 pixel font. It couldn't fit into a normal screen with a, a, a regular font. It just like, he made it so like, you know, like bento box in Japanese restaurants. You have these little boxes and you make everything fit that was basically his wireframe it has no title it just like like put all of the elements on the page like okay then also it was missing like half of the user journey like okay you had the beginning you had the end but actually to build a product you have a lot of different steps in between and he didn't prepare those so there was a big conflict because the design team took a lot of time actually reworking the wireframes and we took also a lot of time actually adding those extra strings and at some point people were asking like yeah but we had a um business analysis who did the wireframes why are you redoing the wireframes just put a paint on top of that so it's really important to understand kind of the roles and responsibilities and to define this upfront like who's doing what on the project and i'm not saying that business analysts should never do wireframes like i know a lot of business analysts who do great wireframes it's just that we need to make sure that everyone understand each other's role and we have kind of this uh, way of communicating and working together that is efficient and not like, okay, why did you redo the work of someone else? Because actually the people didn't really understand what we were doing. And yeah, UX is not about making things pretty, <laughs> yet this is hard to understand for other people, especially in super development-driven environments. So this is something I, I learned the hard way, which is basically sometimes um, in dev environment, um, people just Oh, crap, the microphone is doing shitty stuff. Okay, good. So, uh, yeah, people think that you can just like call 
the UX designer or the designer uh, at the end of the project and put some paint on top of something that was developed without any designer in the team because the client is complaining. Uh, and that happened actually a lot. Like we had some projects, even though they knew that there were a design team in the, com in the company and they knew they could ask us to uh, help them with the design. It meant like finding a budget for the design. And most of the time they were not ready to do that. They prefer to have the budget for the development. Then they developed the stuff. And at the end, the client said, yeah, but this is not good. This is not usable. This is not practical. Like, can you do something about that? So they came back to us and say, yeah, can you put some pain? The client is not happy. So it's really a tough spot to be in because you kind of, try to fix stuff that were done wrong, but without having too much refactoring, things like that. So usually what you used to do is use this an, as an opportunity to teach other people about UX design. So use this an, as an opportunity to teach developers to say, okay, I'm gonna try to do whatever I can with the small amount of time I have now. Please next time come to the design team earlier. We might be able to help you. And actually on some project, I was even able to kind of have some usability testing saying, okay, I'm going to try to make things better, but I want to test it this time before we develop it. So we did kind of sneak into some usability testing at the end of the project based on, okay, it's not working. We need a designer to fix all of that. So that's the idea. It's really annoying when people don't understand design and it's a tough position to be in, but it's also kind of an opportunity to teach them about better process and tell them like how to work in a better way next time with you. And as I mentioned, uh, in the previous consulting company, I was working within the design team, but now today I work for Maltem, which is another consulting company. I'm like 100% consultant, which means I go to different clients. So sometimes it's small missions. I was like, okay, we need someone for two, three months. Most of the time they transform the three months into six months, then in one year or something like that. So it usually starts with a kind of a smaller mission and then they discover that actually we need a designer more than three months and then you, you get to stay and things like that. So um, this is why I'm kind of able to work on, on for a lot of uh, different clients like bank, uh, airlines and things like that. So today I work for uh, something called European Investment Bank, which is a little bit complicated. It's uh, part private, part European uh, and it's basically a bank that um, gives uh, uh, dispatched the European money to different projects across all Euro Europe. But I think we, we also have a project outside of Europe. So today my work <laughs> looks something a little bit like that. So as you, you can see, there's not a lot of design. There's a lot of uh, Excel sheet. There's a lot of uh, like uh, flows and stuff like that. So um, I do a lot of things because I'm kind of working alone for them. So we usually start with quantitative analysis, which is here, which is we don't have analytics, but we have a server log. So we know who visited which pages. So the idea is we have this core squad where we are basically migrating an old, more than 10 years old tool to a new interface. We are changing the whole technology. Now we are going through React components, things like that. So from the technological part, it's quite interesting. And for the design part, we said, okay, instead of migrating all of those 40 pages one by one, and maybe a lot of stuff that is going to be migrated was never used. What we said is we are going to go to um, quantitative analysis, check which pages are um, the most used by whom. Then we know the what which is basically who is using what, but we have no idea why they're using it and what specific part of the page they use. So we combine this with qualitative um, user, um, user research, which is me and the business analyst, we go to the users, we ask them a lot of questions. We also sometimes even ask them to do tasks for us like, oh, that sounds interesting. Please uh, share your screen and show me how you would do that. So this is this part, which is basically the framework we use to gather um, user information. And then what we have is a kind of a priority matrix here. So the priority matrix is once we have collected all of the users needs and feedback, 
there's some needs that only one person in the bank has, and it's going to cost a lot of money because it's going to be a lot of, de of to develop. And then there's like stuff that almost every user needs, but it might cost money. And you have like things that a lot of users need, or almost every user needs, and also that might not cost that much money. So the idea of this uh, framework is basically you have a column for the um, business needs, you have a column for the user needs. So this is basically ratings like points. Then you have a column which is how much is going to cost in terms of design and how much is going to cost in terms of development. And then this builds this matrix. And in this matrix, now we see like what is cheap to develop and all of the user wants right now, which is by basically what we need to build first to help us. And then we have like those features that only one person asked for and that maybe no one else might be using and it really costs a lot of money. And we'll deal with those features at the end of the project if we still have budget. So it's kind of a way to say, okay, we have a lot of user needs, but we also have a project, we have business needs. So it's a way to reconcile all of that. So I do a lot of things like that, which is basically like user flow to help the developer understand how the components are going to, to work. I do usability testing. So at the moment I'm fully remote. We spend like one day in uh, the office in September. And then we had the second wave of COVID in Luxembourg. It's like, you know what? No, you, you, you just stay home at the moment. We're not gonna reopen the office until you need to be there. So I'm basically doing usability testing on Skype. And then, of course, like all of the mock-ups, stuff like that. So it's kind of a lot of work. I wish I, we would hire a second designer at some point. It would be super nice, but it's also quite interesting. So here, what I've learned so far on the project is like, there's something, uh, some sort of magic wand uh, myth around UX design. It's a little bit complicated to explain, but uh, there's different levels of, of much of designing companies like a lot of companies are hostile to design or indifferent like they don't think it will play a big role for them or it's not interesting but then all of a sudden one project uh, within the company gets a huge success and the reason it got a huge success is that they have a UX designer or just a designer or UI designer but they have the word design so now all of a sudden, the other people on the other project inside the company, they associate the word UX design or design with, okay, it makes things better. It can bring successful products. But they're not aware of the whole kind of um, process. And um, what happens is then they're trying to mimic this thing without really understanding them. So you end up in a position where you have people who say, oh, your job uh, sounds uh, super fun and super easy. Can you give me uh, some tips to make this more uh, UX? Make it UX. What do you mean? User-friendly, usable, stuff like that. Or, oh, I want to be a UX. Uh, can you recommend me two books to read? Like, and honestly, it drives me mad because you would never ask uh, the, a Java, JavaScript developer, okay, your job sounds so super fun. Uh, can you teach me JavaScript in two days or something like that? But this, this is, happens a lot uh, in low maturity company because they don't see the whole process. They don't see like, they see someone talks to the user at some, some point. So they see the beginning, they see, oh, it's actually better at the end, but they don't see all of the different steps that actually require a lot of different skills. So it's kind of a weird situation to be in and eventually it will get better. So the solution to get out of this is usually to actually teach them the whole process. Show them that it's not just like I talk to a bunch of people and it magically makes product better. There's kind of time and stuff like that. And eventually maturity of the company usually grow. They find budgets and they stop asking you to teach other pe uh, people how to do your job and they start hiring more and more designers. And the last thing is turning developers into design allies is really, really important, um, especially in super development driven agile environments, which is most of the environment I'm working on uh, when I'm working with clients directly. So uh, today I try to document a lot of things for the developers and uh, I try to be as developer friendly as I can be so that I give them a lot of feedback. So. I attend the development meeting. I'm there during the scrum meetings, things like that. I give them also a lot of 
information about user research. Basically, when we are building a feature, I'm explaining to them the background of this feature. And I can have a small summary of, okay, we did some usability uh, testing or we did some user research. We interviewed a few people who are going to build that because that, 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 and that. So that they kind of feel more involved and they're not just like developers building features, but really like people who are participating in a whole project that is going to be a success for the users. Uh, also, I usually try to involve developers super early in the stages, especially because we have data that comes from a lot of different APIs and sometimes it's a nightmare to fetch them. So usually uh, we have every uh, week a meeting where I present the mockups and the idea is there for the developer to ask me questions question or also to challenge some of the design solution because maybe I didn't think about something or maybe some stuff are technically not possible, things like that. And last but not least, I usually share verbatim with them because I think it's super important. So verbatim is a nice, uh, I think it's uh, verbatim, it's Latin word to say uh, a quote but we call those verbal teams in the UX field. So I basically um, share verbal teams with them as uh, when users say something like, oh, I really like the new search and this is awesome, or oh, the filter function is so amazing. Uh, things like that, like super positive feedback from the, um, the users. I also bring them back to the developer because I'm kind of the one in the front line with the users. So I get the bad feedback, but I also get the good ones. And I think it's important to communicate to the developers also like, look, people, your work is having an impact. It's amazing. Users are happy. This was a good idea. So. That's really, really cool. And last but not least, I'm basically documenting a lot of stuff like that. So this is a design system we are documenting. We are documenting like the colors, all of that, but also like padding margins, how it's supposed to work, like what happens when you click on something and stuff. So there's a lot of uh, flows, documentation, documenting the um, component and different states, stuff like that. So this is also kind of part of my job, but this is more like UI design than UX design. But as I said, I'm currently working alone, so I'm doing a little bit of kind of UX design and product design at the same time. And yeah, basically that's it. So I think you might have questions. Here, um, I'll jump in and um, we can discuss the questions that students have sent in to us. Do you want to take back the screen sharing maybe? Yeah, for sure. Just give me one moment. Okay. Can you see this? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So thank you, Stephanie, for going over <clears throat> Sorry, your role, your job, everything that you do like at your workplace. It was really interesting to hear from your side of things. Um, just a couple of the questions that students have sent in. So for those of us who are interested in um, joining the field, do you have any advice on how you can become better involved as a student? So I know like you've taken a psychology for UX and product design workshop. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend something similar to that for other students or is there something along those lines that students can do? Uh, there's a lot of books. So I don't know if you as a student have access to a big library, but I know my students have uh, in France, they have access to almost all of the O'Reilly and things like that. So I don't know what, how it is in other countries, but I know that usually when you are a student, you have access to many, many libraries. So there's a lot of interesting books. There's actually the guy who gave the workshop on psychology for UX and product. He basically wrote a book and I think it's a free ebook now. So you can find it online. So it's a good introduction. I can send uh, some links, but I have to check on my blog. I have a... Um, bibliography on my blog with a lot of books and they are kind of ordered by theme and there's a whole theme on psychology so there's a few interesting books um yeah but this is more like uh getting involved into uh psychology so is the question about involved with the industry as, yeah, like as the ux industry or you get like a head start as a student into getting involved with the career especially if you're not like directly in the industry itself like if you're not pursuing to get a degree related to ui ux how can you get involved i think you can start by getting in touch with some uxs so 
I met someone who said that basically when they were studying, they were not studying UX design, they were studying development, but they asked uh, a UX designer if they could shadow them. So the idea, I don't know if you're familiar with shadowing, mm -hmm. but it's basically you're like behind a person, like not literally, figuratively, but it was basically like he was uh, able to attend to a few usability tests and to a few interviews and things like that. So it was kind of seeing how that person was working. I think that was interesting. Uh, also, I, I need my blog. I'm super bad at name. There's uh, a place, wait, let me, two minutes. Um, I wrote an, a whole article, but it was mostly for students of UX design on how to gain experience or something like that. But there's uh, some projects, which is basically uh, open source projects, things like that. And uh, usually you can also try to get involved, uh, especially if you're already developing it might be easy to say, okay, you know what, maybe we could try to do some usability research here. We can maybe try to interview some people. So as students, if you're already having like side projects or projects, like usually students, you have projects that you need to do for the school. It could be interesting to, to go to this kind of things. And there's a lot of resources online on how to conduct interview. It will not be perfect. It will never be perfect. But you can also try to find a mentor if you're interested in saying, okay, I want to know a little bit more. Can we schedule a session where I can ask you a lot of questions? Just if you want someone to mentor you, you need to understand that it's um, kind of um, a relationship where you need to actually help them mentor you. In a way, like you need to come with questions and like specific questions and things like that, because the idea is to help the students uh, as a mentor. Uh, so if the student doesn't have like specific questions or things they want to talk about, it's a little bit more complex. So usually I think mentoring is interesting when you actually started like maybe playing around with a project and you say, oh, you know what? I'm going to do my first uh, user interview. Could you take a look maybe at my interview script and give me some feedback, things like that. So that's kind of the complicated part, I think, uh, of mentoring is people don't always understand that they actually need to invest a lot of their time, almost more time than the mentors and this thing. So help me help you kind of situation. I really like how you put that, the help me help you idea, because without like a clear idea or goal of what you want to achieve out of that mentorship or the shadowing, mm -hmm. process, as you mentioned, it's not as like valuable for the student. So I definitely like how you put that. Okay, let me move uh, on to the next big. question. Um, yeah, so... On your website, it's very clear to see that um, you've worked with numerous organizations. How did you land so many consulting positions or other jobs at so many different organizations? Uh -huh. So as I said at the beginning, I kind of uh, started networking a lot on Twitter and things like that. So it helps actually know people. Uh, the fun fact is I ended up in Luxembourg by accident. I was, I were, I was working for like as a creation for four years, I think, something like that. And at the end, I was a little bit frustrating on only being kind of part of this uh, kind of a small part of the project things like that so i said you know what i'm gonna give freelancing a try at the end of the year mm -hmm. so i told my bosses okay guys i want to go freelancing at the end of the year uh, there's something that's called rupture conventionnelle in france which is basically uh instead of quitting you ask them kind of a an accord where they give you a little bit of money to help you, but also if you do this kind of rupture conventionnelle, you can get uh, the money from the government that you usually get when you're fired, which should help you usually get started. Okay, okay, I see, I see what you're saying. Okay, um, we're running a little short on time, so I'll do one more question um, from the prepared questions, and then the students can get a chance to ask just live questions. Just to wrap up this part, uh, what are some of the recommended prospective companies to apply for in terms of internships for students who are interested in entering the UI UX field? Stephanie? Give us one moment, guys. I think we might be facing a little bit of a technical error. 
Stephanie, um, I'm not sure if it's just me, but I can't seem to hear you. I'm not sure if you're muted, perhaps. Can everyone else hear Stephanie, or is it just mine? No, I can't hear Steph can't hear. either. Okay, thank you. Um, Stephanie, we're unable to hear you. The microphone might have broken. Is it good now? Oh, yeah. I can. Oh, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Sorry, go for it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was saying it, it really depends on your area. So I can't give you names of companies because basically I don't know where you live. So it's a little bit complicated. Sure. What I can tell you is uh, first I would figure out what type of company you want to work for. Do you want to work in an agency and you want to do a lot of different work? Do you want to work in a startup? Do you want to work directly? Uh, within the teams of your clients. And another advice would be try, and it's a little bit hard sometimes, especially as designers, because a lot of company tends to only hire one of them, but try to find a company where there's already another designer that can mentor you, that can help you, can give you feedback, things like that. Right. So usually you try to check the website of the company or you just ask the recruiters, okay, am I going to be alone? as a junior designer, as a junior UX, but I think it also applies to developers. Like, am I going to be alone or do you already have a team? So I, yeah, I can't really like recommend companies, but Specific, this um, would be my main thing. Fine. I think it's like you're saying, like reach out to the recruiter, be direct, ask, you know, um, what are you expecting out of the design, um, the designer? Is it like a team? Is it a smaller team, larger team? Having that clarity on who you're working with and what the working environment is like could definitely be beneficial when you're applying. So yeah, that's a good point. Okay, I think we can go ahead and skip right to the live Q&A portion. So for those students who do have questions that you'd like to ask Stephanie, please feel free to enter your questions into the chat, or if you feel comfortable, you may unmute your mic and ask her yourselves. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you so much for Hi. the workshop today. Uh, I was just wondering, I'm a first year student and I have absolutely no experience um, with any of this. So I'm wondering, do you have any sort of advice for starting points if we're looking into um, online courses? Is there anything specifically that would help in um, what should we learn first? Because there's so much information out there, right? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would reach out to, to people because like I don't know everything that's out there, like all of the courses and everything. But I think there's like uh, Udemy and Skillshare have some pretty cheap courses. So even if the course is bad, usually it's like $9 or something like that. So I would try maybe, it also depends if you prefer to listen to someone or if you prefer to read. For me, I prefer reading blog posts and uh, articles and things like that. So yeah, there's a lot of noise. It's really, really complicated. Uh, and this would need um, kind of a full detailed answer. But uh, may I uh, send you an article where I put basically a lot of resources, but some re reliable sources for uh, UX design is uh, UX a user experience professional association they have a lot of resources on their website i also kind of really like um what's the name interactive design foundation idf you have to pay by the month i don't remember how much it costs but they have a lot of uh, courses i haven't taken any courses myself there but i heard a lot of good things from um from uh, students who went to inter uh, interaction design.org so i'm gonna put in the chat a link which is basically oh, brilliant. Like, how, how can i find my first ux job and uh, yeah it's a super big topic like it's a 17 word pages uh, article but yeah there's a lot of things there's a lot of communities and uh, i especially of like students of ux also are doing a lot of events around that so definitely reach out for those. And uh, if you have a question about uh, do you think this website is a reliable source or not, just like DM me on LinkedIn or something. And because there's some website that look kind of genuine and it's a little bit complicated to see if it's really like good content or not. So 
yeah there's a lot of noise thank you so much just a heads up guys like we'll definitely be forwarding um stephanie's information so that if you guys do have more questions that you didn't get to ask today you can definitely reach out to her and at the same time like yeah. her blog is very very helpful if you guys have had a chance to look over it we'll definitely be sending the link to her blog as well i think we have time for one more question if anybody has one I'm gonna put my LinkedIn. Just when you, if you had me uh, taking your coin, you're coming from um, Deaf Student Clubs because I have a, a lot of invitation and I don't know always have time to check it. So just give me some context, like hi, we met there, and then I will uh, accept you uh, on LinkedIn, and then you can ask me some more questions <laughs> if you have some uh, that maybe pop up to your mind tomorrow or something, or maybe even later. Okay, fair enough. All right, I think with that, we can wrap up today's session. Just a huge shout out and thank you to Stephanie. Like that was genuinely such an thank insight you. Like, on explaining yeah, like, that. Was yeah, fun. And thank you like for everyone who joined. I hope you guys gained like a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of insight into the industry and you guys learned a little something. Definitely. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.